Now that Nikon has finally joined the mirrorless world with their semi-pro range camera, well, a camera in that $4,000 price range and right below their flagship camera, we now have the triumvirate of full-frame cameras to look at now from Sony, Nikon, and Canon. The Sony a7R5, the Nikon Z8, and the Canon R5. How do these cameras stack up for wildlife photography? How do they perform in the wild? Well, let's talk about it. Mirrorless cameras. To me, this started a new area in photography to me, and I'm sure many others. Just the advent of the electronic viewfinder itself changed how I was able to capture images in the field much more efficiently and improve the keeper rate. Or just really get it right in camera more often and keep my eye on the viewfinder versus checking constantly to see if I was getting it right. Not to mention the eye detect and subject detection capabilities that came along with the staggering frame rates per second in stills. As we all know, Sony started the mirrorless kickoff, and they were miles ahead of the game with the A7 and the A9 lines. And their latest addition is the Sony A7R5 right here. Some would say, including me, that the A9 II is more the real-world equivalent for the Canon and Nikon due to its 20 frames per second and stack sensor, whose readout speed is 6.2 milliseconds. Yet its 20 megapixel sensor and age, released in October 2019, make it fall behind as far as the autofocus system and the 61 megapixels of the A7R5. But the A7R5 only shoots seven frames per second, and the sensor has a super slow speed of 66 milliseconds, making rolling shutter pretty bad when panning along with the blackout and EVF lag. So for this review, and I'm probably not gonna make a lot of people happy, I'm gonna to toss out the A7R5 in this review with this $4,000 midline camera wildlife photography. Why? This guy is really not a wildlife photography camera in my opinion. The autofocus, if you'll watch my video that I did a while back, I wasn't very impressed with the autofocus system on this thing when you're getting low and trying to hit something at distance. It just failed for me and I, I've tested it out for a couple months, tested this camera out, and it just doesn't work for me on those type things for wildlife. And the EVF lag, the blackout, all those things are just too rough for me. So this is not a wildlife camera, in my opinion. Uh, if you're gonna shoot something that's still all day long and not moving a lot, yeah, you could use it. But for what we're talking about, for a good wildlife camera in that semi-pro range, I means you just don't wanna buy the flagship, but you want the right below the flagship, this camera isn't it. If the A93 ever comes out, if you haven't even heard of a good rumor on it lately, if it ever comes out and it's in the 30 megapixels or more, then we'll redo this shootout, and by then, the R5 Mark II will probably be out. But for now, the Sony a7R5, and I'm sorry guys that are Sony fans, uh, this one it, to me is out of the mix for what we're gonna talk about here. So I'm gonna set you over here. Um, again, now this is a good camera, don't get me wrong. This has a really good sensor. Uh, and also, this sensor is A7R4 sensor also, so you're really using an older sensor. These other two cameras have more newer sensors on our line, especially the Z9, Z8, excuse me, I'll cut a Z9 just in, because it is a baby Z9. But it is a good camera, but um, it's just not, a, to me, a wildlife camera for what we need to do in today's day and age, and there's cameras that uh, have a lot less price range that'll do more than this does for wildlife. Anyway, moving on. Now we're down to these two guys. Okay, let's talk about the Canon R5 and the Nikon Z9 cameras, and then we'll get into some real world comparisons in the field on some bird photography. We'll start with the sensors, the Canon R5 first. This camera's getting along in the tooth. It was released uh, July of 2020, so it's going on three years old, but still holds up well as far as specs and real world performance. And real world performance is what we're talking about. Best guess is the next spring we may have a successor being released. We'll hope, we'll hope. The camera supports a 45 megapixel CMOS sensor with a 15.5 millisecond readout speed, making for a very nice rolling shutter performance and plenty of room for cropping and recomposition. Anything really above 35 megapixels or so is that sweet pot for me for wildlife photography. It contains Canon's Digic X processor, which is the same as the flagship 1DX Mark III, even though it's a DSLR, and the semi-flagship Canon R3. Yes, that camera is priced at flagship, but that's really not a wildlife camera unless you can shoot 20 megapixels, but that's not for me. Now, for the Nikon Z8. It was released just this May, and it sports the same backside illuminated stack CMOS sensor as the Z9, coming in at 
45.7 megapixels and an impressive fast industry fastest readout speed currently at 3.7 milliseconds for virtually no rolling shutter. And we've had a year and a half to see how the sensor performs in the Z9 and it performs very well. Again, the 45.7 megapixel is very impressive in its ability to crop and recompose if needed, just like the Canon R5. So on paper, we should see is possibly more rolling shutter on the R5 versus the Z8. In the real world, and after a few years of shooting the R5, there is some rolling shutter, but it's very, very little. And you can eliminate completely if you're in front curtain shutter or mechanical. Image quality of both sensors is very, very good. Personally, I think the Canon Color Science is more magenta color tones and Nikon is more warm tones. And the backside illuminated sensor is really noticeable if you compare both cameras in the field at the same shutter speed and aperture, as you need less ISO in the Nikon to achieve the similar exposure and less noise at higher ISOs, because that's what a backside illuminated sensor does. It allows you to shoot at higher ISOs with less noise. Another thing I noticed with the Nikon sensor is the catch lights and the rim lights I see in the colors is much warmer in that color tone. And one thing you have to remember on these two sensors is that the Nikon sensor on the Z8 is the exact same sensor as the Z9, which is Nikon's flagship. Canon's entry at the Canon R5 is not the flagship sensor. It's not a backside illuminated sensor. It's not a stack sensor. It's a true semi-pro sensor. As, you know, if you use the R3, you'll see in that improvement of the backside limited stack sensor, what it does on R3 as far as the image goes and the ISO performance, even though it's a lower megapixel, which also helps with the ISO performance. But that's the difference between two sensors. This is a flagship sensor and processor. This is a flagship processor, but not a flagship sensor, if that makes sense. Uh, it's very evident of how much that backside, like I'm saying, stack sensor helps. So again, on paper, the image quality would go to me the Z8, but the color science and the color tones are more personal and artistic performance. But again, both are extremely, extremely good. We'll look at that in the field, the image quality that is later in this video. I use the cover shutter speed in frames per second along with the sensor. So let's talk about that now. The Canon sports both mechanical and electronic shutter. You can shoot up to 12 frames per second in mechanical and first curtain, and up to 20 frames per second in full electronic and uncompressed RAW. In full electronic shutter, you have no shutter sound. You can only get shutter sound in the mechanical and first curtain electronic. The Nikon Z8 only has an electronic shutter. It will shoot up to 20 frames per second in lossless RAW. It will also shoot up to 120 frames per second in JPEG, as well as having a pre-capture mode to capture up to one second of images before the shutter press, but only in JPEG shooting mode, ranging from 30 frames a second to 120 frames a second. So what that means is hold the shutter down halfway, take your shot, it'll record. If you did 120 frames a second, it'll do 120 frames in JPEG. If you do 30, it'll 30. If you do 60, it'll do 60. For, it's one second, remember, of what frame that you're at. So that's what the pre-capture is in this guy. This doesn't have it. They do have it on the other cameras that came after this, but the R5 does not have the pre-capture functionality in it. You set the amount of sound on the shutter from completely silent to fairly audible on the Nikon Z8. Now the shutter differences as far as how far they'll go. The Canon will do up to 1 8 thousandth of a second on the shutter, and Nikon will do a whopping 32 thousandths of a second on a shutter. Those hummingbirds don't stand a chance with that shutter speed. In full RAW, both cameras shoot at 20 frames per second, which is the format most semi-pro photographers are shooting. So ignoring rolling shutter differences, they're neck and neck unless you need to shoot past 1 8 thousandths of a second or required audible shutter sound. And on the Canon R5, when I owned it in the past, I never shot 20 frames a second unless I just really needed it because I really needed that audible sound. So I always shot in the first curtain electronic to get that audible sound and I was only shooting at 12 frames a second. So in that scenario for me as my shooting was, I would probably give it to the Z8 because I can shoot 20 frames a second and hear it also. And if I do need to go past 8 thousandths, I can. I usually don't, but, but in this little small thing, I, I would give it to the Z8 in that. Now we'll talk about buffers when shooting full raw, which is compressor on this one, lossless on this one, at 20 frames per second and using the fastest CF Express Type B card. Both cameras will get about 100 and 110 images before they hit the buffer wall. And at that wall is where these two cameras start to differ. For the Canon R5, it'll basically go into a limp mode and it'll, after it hits that 100 or so frames, when it drops down, it'll get about five to eight frames per second. 
The Z8 will continue to shoot past that wall. So once it shoots 20 frames a second, it gets about the 110, 115. After that, it will go reduce mode or limp mode. Well, that limp mode is 15 to 16 frames per second, almost until you fill the card up. So what that means, you can do those extremely long bursts with the Z8 of those long swan takeoffs or any other long encounters you find. So to me, in this scenario, the Z8 is going to win again uh, if you need more than 110 shots, that is. Now on the electronic viewfinders of both cameras. The Canon sports a 5.7 million dot EVF, which is very, very nice. It's very bright and very vivid. There's no blackout in shooting, rather it flickers at the edges, but it's not very noticeable to me. Actually, your eye will go away from it. Now on to the LCD. On paper, the LCDs of both cameras are pretty much the same. They both support a 3.2 inch screen with 2.1 million dots. Both support a touch screen, are very responsive and vivid, and work well in direct sunlight. The big difference is the articulating screens. The cannons will swivel and flip forward for viewing to the monitor and down the lens. The Nikon has a hinge display, but it does not flip around. So who wins? Well, for wildlife, it's not a huge deal either way. The Nikon allows for low and high shooting for the monitor to still be in line with the lens as the cannons will be off to the side. It's more of a plus for landscape guys, and the flip around is really more helpful if you're filming yourself. And we really don't do selfies with uh, Kodiak Bear behind us, so to me it's not a big deal breaker. So the articulation difference between the two is a wash to me. Okay, on to the ergonomics. Both feel great in the hand. The Nikon Z8 is just a touch heavier than the R5, but not by much. The button placements are in completely different places. Everything is backwards, even how you put the lenses on, one's clockwise, one's counterclockwise. Uh, but both cameras are very customizable in the buttons and made for your shooting needs. I'd say both cameras need the battery grip. And this is an area where Canon wins to me, as the battery grip that comes on the Canon feels better than the Nikon's to me. But it's really a personal choice. And why is that difference to, to me? Well, the Canon is more smooth and feels like the, you know, the full uh, integrated grip bodies. And the Nikon's has more of a cutout bump on it. So it's just a little more comfortable there. But feel is a personal choice, so I really can't give it a win to either one, and they both feel really good. Now onto the menu systems. Well, Canon's to me is a lot easier to use, but the Nikon has more fine-tuning abilities. Again, really that's a personal choice, so what's better for you? Because even if you talk about the Sony, um, it's kind of in between the two, and people gripe about the Sony's menus, but be honest, I, I, I actually found my way around the Sony okay. I didn't really have a huge problem. It just was different. So I think, again, just like I talked about the autofocus, which we'll talk about in a bit later on both these cameras, it's a matter of putting time behind the camera. And yes, I did put time behind the Sony as far as the autofocus system. And I talked to a lot of my Sony shooter friends about this A7R5. The A1 does act different. We'll review that another day. All right, on to the battery. This is kind of a weird one here. The Canon R5 body sports a 2,130 milliamp hours, which is lower than the Nikon's 2,280 milliamp hours. On paper, it seems the battery life should be better on the Z8, but in use, the R5 battery lasts a little bit longer. It seems that the uh, voltage energy pull out of the Z8 is much larger than the R5. And I can switch batteries in the middle, towards the end of the day with the R5 and still have a lot of battery left over on a good full day shoot. On the Z8, when I swap the battery out, I'm still run out by the end of the day on a busy shoot day. So there is that. So I would say for the battery, the R5 wins out as far as that goes. But again, just have three batteries to this guy and it's a wash. All right, on to autofocus. We'll talk about it actually performs when we get out in the field and use it here in a bit, but for now we're just gonna talk briefly about the functionality of the setups. Both cameras have subject detection of animals, people, and vehicles, and of course we care about is really just animals. Both have eye detection, and the Nikon has 3D tracking that Canon doesn't have, which just means if you can get the autofocus point on the subject and activate the 3D tracking, it'll find the body and the head of the eye, and it'll just lock onto it. Both cameras allow setting autofocus areas that so would also help lock the eye if it's inside the focus area. With the Nikon, it's very essential that you use that right type of autofocus area with the correct type of environment to locate your bird or animal. Canon's a lot more forgiving that you just use the eye autofocus and will search the entire scene within the viewfinder and find the animal. Again, we'll talk more about this once we get to the field and use it a bit more there. So on paper, that's how the two cameras stack up. So let's head out to the field and talk about how they actually perform in the real world, and then we'll draw our conclusions.
The R5 was paired up with the Canon EF 500 f4 Mark II. It's an adapted lens, but doesn't act adapted as is one of the Canon's big whites. The Z8 I had paired with the Nikon Z 400 4.5 lens. This is a very well performing lens and native to the mount for the Z8. For me, this gives both cameras their best chance of achieving the autofocus potential and image quality. Of course, the Z8 combo here is lighter in weight, but 100 millimeters shorter in focal length as well as depth of field. So keep that in mind when we get to the images later on. So a bit of information about filming these shorebirds. I only recorded the EVF on the Nikon Z8 with the Atomos, and why is that? Well, this is actually a plus for the Z8 versus the R5. So when you hook an external recorder up to a Nikon camera, especially the new mirrorless cameras, you can still see the, see the EVF. If you hook it up on the Canon R5, you can no longer see through the LCD of the EVF, you can only see it through the monitor, the EVF monitor, or sorry, the Atomos monitor. What does that mean? Well, to get the best tracking, to test the autofocus, to get the best images, I really need to look to the viewfinder of both cameras because trying to track a bird in flight or something moving fast with doing this is just impossible. But to be able to hold it up to your eye and track it, you can do it all day long. So that's why you only see EVF footage out of the Nikon, but I've got other EVF footage I can show you out of the R5 that I've recorded before, and you've probably seen it before, but now you get to see this one and see what it looks like. So just a little bit of note about filming that if you don't see EVF footage from the Canon R5. So when I headed out in the field to try to compare these two cameras, I carried both cameras out in the field, and as I said earlier, I got lucky and ran across these yellow legs. Now the light was okay, it was kind of a high sun, partly cloudy afternoon, and we were down amongst the trees, so I was getting a lot of mottled light too. So it wasn't the easiest shoot to do, but I, luckily the birds got enough in the light for sometimes to get some decent shots of them. So I started out with the R5. Get out of here, Z8. And I had the camera in full electronic shutter, that way I could reach the 20 frames per second. The only downside is there's no shutter sound in full electronic, but I felt this would also let us know at the max frames per second how the rolling shutter perform with this sensor on this camera. And from reviewing the images, even on a pan shot, it's really not that bad. The autofocus setup that I had on the R5 was either the eye autofocus or the single point to push through the busy spots to regain focus to help the autofocus system succeed. And you can find out more about that. I've got plenty of videos on how to set this camera up and all the other Canon cameras. And the Canon locked up the bird's eye almost every time or the body. It didn't seem to care much about the busy backgrounds when they were really close to the bird. And I didn't need the single point too much to correct or push through to a spot much at all. I would catch the bird perched and work my angles to get different backgrounds until the bird I was concentrating on would finally fly to a new perch. This was a very tricky spot to catch these birds in flight. It was an extremely tight area and they would just zip by you real fast. You didn't have much time to even spin on them. I did manage a few times where I could swing the lens around on one in mid-flight and once in frame I was able to lock it up really quick and get a couple frames of shots. The hit rate of the images was pretty good on the R5 after reviewing the images. We'll look more about image quality difference in a bit after we talk more about how the Z8 performed. Overall, the Canon R5 performed very well as far as locking up the birds, snapping quickly to the bird, and getting the exposure I wanted to inside the EVF. And the rig felt very good in the hand and the setup I used, which I have videos on that you can watch and I'll link that in the description. It helped me keep my eye on the viewfinder and not looking around for buttons and dials to get the settings right. But that no shutter sound when hitting that shutter doesn't feel right, and I also wasn't sure how many shots I was getting on each shutter pull. 
bit, I switched the Nikon Z8 and the 400 4.5 lens. This setup feels really good. The lens is really light and this rig was easier to lug around for extended periods. Had the autofocus set to wide L as I was in a busy tight environment and a second single point button set up along with the 3D tracking buttons. This gives me three modes at my fingertips for the different modes I need in this tight environment with these birds. The wide L to get the focus plane and lock the eye detection up. 3D to just lock up the bird if I get the focus point right up on top of the bird or hand off in the wide L. And lastly, a single point for the same reason with Canon R5 to push through to focus the spot to help out with the subject detection modes. For the most part, the wide L would lock up the bird. There were times that the autofocus would hit the background rather than the birds, and this is due to the focus plane being too far away or too close to me from the bird. In this case, the thing to do, and this is true for the Canon also, is to point the camera towards the ground or something close to the bird, and use a single point to move the focus plane closer to the bird, and then go right back to the bird to get the subject to detect of the wide L or the 3D to lock it up. Now, with the R5, I didn't have to do this very much at all, but on the Z8, I had to do it more often than I wanted to. Now this is a trick you need to learn real fast to get yourself back in the game and give the autofocus its best chance of success. As far as catching these guys in flight, pretty hard with the Z8 in this tight environment. A couple times I grabbed a brief focus but not long enough to get the shot. Now this is a super tight area also and the flight was maybe less than two seconds in a circle around me. So to get a lock up you had to get the camera around to the bird and then try to circle with it. Extremely, extremely difficult and hard. I did manage to get a couple times with the R5 but not really with the Z8. This is the one area that Canon autofocus perform much better than the Nikon on these yellow legs. Again, a very tough test. But once the Nikon Z8 locked up the bird, it stayed locked up. Just the flight stuff was a little bit off and I wasn't able to get a lock. Now, a quick word about birds in flight here real quick, in case you're thinking that the Canon wins on birds in flight. In this flight, in the close background scenarios, it did win. And in open sky or less busy backgrounds, they're very, very close in performance. The Canon edges at the scenario on small birds at distance though. When we were in Kodiak with the Kingfishers with the bird flying a perpendicular flight path low across the water against a semi-busy background, the Nikon locked up the plane of focus the bird was on quicker than the Canon could lock up the bird itself. And that was even with the more advanced R7 autofocus than the Canon R5 had. So in this scenario, the Nikon's autofocus won out. As far as the setup and use of the camera on the Z8 in the field, same as the Canon, I was able to stay inside the EVF and get my settings just right for what I was shooting. And the backside luminate sensor really helped out being able to shoot a lower ISO in the same light as the R5. And having that shutter sound while shooting stills at 20 frames a second really helped on the field over the R5. I really didn't know how many frames I was getting out of the R5. Mm -hmm.
image quality and hit rate in a minute. But first, which camera did I enjoy using more that day photographing those yellow legs and a couple robins that popped in for a bit? Well, you're probably not gonna like this answer. I really liked them both. The Canon was more enjoyable on just knowing that I could get focus fast and easy. And it had more time on bird than with the Nikon. And at times I have to use a single point in the Nikon to acquire the bird or something close to the bird, then refocus and re-engage the wide L or the 3D tracking. The only time I had to do this with the R5 was when one of the birds landed high up in a birch tree with a lot of leaves. But the Nikon was more enjoyable to me with getting the exposure and playing with the light more in the EVF. That backside illuminated sensor and color tones in the EVF made for adjusting the scene just a little bit easier for me. If I had to choose which one's better, I would edge out and say the Canon R5 for getting a shot, but the Z8 if I was wanting to get the shot. Which means it would take a hair longer to either lock up the bird in the area with a Z8, but quicker to adjust to a good exposure with a Z8. And I think that's the difference between these two cameras when it comes to how they perform in the field in almost every scenario. I've used the Canon R5 for over two years, and I've used the Z9 and the Z8 for over a year. They're basically the same camera in this sense, other than weight. It's that for 70% of the scenarios, the Canon will lock up the subject the fastest, not on small subjects and farther away especially, but on a few situations, the Nikon will get that plane of focus faster. And on the 10 or 15% that's left, both of them are gonna have issues. And for experimenting with the exposure, the Nikon is just much easier to me. And that shutter sound not existing at full electronic on the R5 is just a headache. They both will lock up birds in flight most of the time, but the Canon is really gonna win out most of the times on those birds in flight. And on your not normal animals, kind of like the doll sheep was, the Canon R5 will find them and find them at distance and find their head in the eye, and the Nikons will still have a little bit of trouble finding like the doll sheep. But for moose, they both find it pretty well. But for more odd birds, Canon just had more time putting something into that algorithm to see what it is. But both do extremely well. We're just very spooled as far as autofocus goes anymore and what we expect it to do, which is succeed in every environment we put it in. But in this test with the yellow legs, the R5 edged it out with doing just the autofocus worked a little bit better in this tight, busy environment. Okay, let's look at the image quality, the colors, and the hit rate. What do we see here? Well, for the image quality, they both look really good. One thing I do notice is the contrast lines are sharper with the Canon and are a little heavier than the Nikons. And over the last few years of shooting with the Canon R5 and the last year or so shooting the Z8-Z9, I just have to say I get more better images out of the Z8-Z9 than I get out of the R5. There's just less I have to do in the editing process afterwards. So I get it right in camera more often. And that's just more of a personal thing probably. Okay, hit rate. On this test, when it wasn't burden flight, and remember hit rate is when you're dropping the hammer on that shutter, it was very, very close. I did have a couple of the R5 where I could see some stretch and a little bit of rolling shutter, but nothing extremely noticeable if you didn't have a comparable image to compare it against. As far as out of focus with the burst, again, both cameras have most in focus, but just a couple where it shifted to the body or just to the eyes or out of the plane of focus. It seemed to be about the same between the two cameras. But I had more shots of yellow eggs with the Canon R5 than I did with the Z8, because the Canon R5 would get there just a little bit faster when the bird was landing or wing flaps and things like that, because I was actually able to hit it much quicker with the R5 than the Z8. So therefore I had more images in a burst with the R5 than the Z8. Now, if the bird was in flight, Canon killed the Z8 in this scenario. But as I stated earlier, there are times when the Z8 has went over the Canon autofocus with birds in flight. Okay, now what about the histories in both these, the R5 and the Z8, over the history that I've used both of these? My conclusion also with this back and forth use of both these cameras, the same subject, the same time, and the same conditions on these yellow legs, who's the winner? Well, for me, it's the Z8. Remember, that's for me. And yes, the autofocus is better and you'll acquire subject faster, more reliable with the Canon R5, which is huge. But the faster sensor readout speed and image output of the Z8 makes that little slower acquisition of autofocus in certain scenarios a trade-off worth living with. But this is understandable as the Canon R5 is a little long in the tooth and its Mark II variant, we believe, is just around the corner. And seeing that the Z8 has the flagship camera sensor, the Z9, the process, the autofocus system, and the R5 has Canon's mid-level and no backside limited stack sensor, the R5 has held up really well. It makes sense that the newest camera with that manufacturer's best of the best components would trump the other guy's three-year-old components and technology. And this is a testament of how good the R5 is still holding up this closely to the best of the best Nikons pushing out today. 
And for Sony, come back here, little guy. I'm actually looking forward to the A9 Mark III coming out, especially with over 30 megapixels. But for today, if I had to choose between the Z8 and the R5, if the lenses weren't in the equation, then the Z8 would be my choice. And you can actually use Canon EF lenses on Nikon Z cameras with adapters, the Fringer adapter. So there's a plus also there of having a lot more lens choices for the Z8. But really, you can't go wrong with either of these cameras, especially the Z8 and the R5. And seeing that as today, you can get the R5 for around a little over $3,300, and the Z8 is still around $4,000 US if you can get hold of one. For the money, the R5 is still really good. Hope this was enjoyable for everyone. Yes, I know everyone is in their camp or tribe or the Sony, the Nikon, or the Canon, but don't be. All the manufacturers are pumping out amazing cameras, including the Fuji, Olympus, Lumix, and all those other brands. It's good to be that the winner of any comparison now is just nitpicking things, and it's starting to get more of what feels better for you in your hand of which camera feels better for you. And the last bit of advice I'd give you about which camera to choose is look at the lenses first. Which brand has the lenses you're most interested in and maybe maybe what you're invested in and then decide on the body as the lenses will be with you for a very long time. Example, this is my 500 f4 Mark II EF lens. It's 14 years old and it's still killing it. And if you're already invested in a manufacturer's lenses, you're going to be okay because everyone has a good camera pretty much right now. Anyway, thanks for watching and do all those good YouTube things like subscribe, share, comment, and please think about becoming a member of this channel to help out funding the content we put out weekly. And as always, until next time, you guys get outside and go run that shutter.